from the time he first started speaking uh, in New Bedford uh, and until r roughly 1850. He would draw howls of laughter by mimicking slave owners, by using sarcasm and irony. And during this period, he would just take down a few notes, know where he would start and finish, and extemporize. And he was as much an actor or performer on stage as he was a public speaker who read. I am very pleased to introduce today's midday guest, John Stouffer, who will speak on the topic, Frederick Douglass, Orator for the Ages. Frederick Douglass was the most famous African-American of the 19th century. He published three autobiographies. Two of them were bestsellers. Uh, he was a household name by mid-century. He was better known than Lincoln until the 1860 presidential election. Uh, he was one of the first African-American fiction writers. Uh, he was a publisher and editor. He edited and published the longest running African-American newspaper. He was the first black man to meet with and advise a United States president. He met with Lincoln three times in the White House, uh, advised him, and they defined themselves as friends publicly, which at that time meant equality. Uh, and another indication of his fame is that, uh, as well, Zoe and I just did this book on picturing Frederick Douglass. He's the most photographed American in the United States. There are more separate photos of Douglass than of Lincoln, than of Twain, than of any other figure, which is another indication uh, of his fame. Uh, during his life, he was most famous as an orator. Today, he's most famous for his narrative. His narrative, his first autobiography, which is 90 pages, a beautiful lyrical account of his life in slavery, uh, is now widely read in high schools and in colleges. But in his day, he was best known as an orator, and throughout his life, he said he felt more comfortable speaking for the public ear than writing for the public eye. So the first question that I want to answer is, why do very few people read or know about Douglass's speeches today? And if they read Douglass or know of him, they know of him through his photographs or his uh, autobiographies. And the short answer is that oratory was very different in the 19th century than it is today, in large part because it was one of the only forms of public entertainment. There was no television, there was no media, you should think of an orator in the 19th century, public speaker, as a professional athlete, a movie star, a radio personality. Uh, people would travel for hundreds of miles just to hear a great orator like Douglas. Uh, he would often attract 5,000 people by the 1850s. It was the primary mode of conveying information immediately to the masses and orators made more money than writers. Douglas supported his newspaper through his public speaking. He ended up becoming uh, upper middle class, comparatively wealthy because of uh, the fees he could command as a public speaker. In fact, he could command a higher public speaking fee than any other uh, American uh, by roughly the Civil War. Uh, and the speeches, normal speeches at this time, were two hours. So think of a rock concert, think of a basketball game. People would come and they'd sit down and they'd listen to this long narrative. And it raises the question, how did Frederick Douglass, who first 20 years of his life were slave, was as, as a slave who was prohibited from reading and writing, how did he become so famous as an orator and then a writer? Well, he learned how to read surreptitiously as a slave, and he virtually cut his eye teeth, memorized six books or authors. And two of them are especially important for his development as an orator. The first is the King James Bible. He understood the Bible as well as better than most ministers today could quote from it. And the King James Bible is one of the great works of literature. It's one of the great texts 
that teaches you how to turn language into an art form. The second was a book designed for young boys, and this was an age in which men spoke, not women. Fiction was the, a venue in which women could disseminate their voice in the 1850s. Uh, but this book was designed for young boys to become effective orders. It was called The Columbian Order, uh, edited by 19, one of the 19th century's great uh, educators, Caleb Bingham, and he compiled a set of speeches and taught young boys how to become effective orators in a democracy. And Douglas uh, read it over and over and virtually memorized it. One of the things that Douglas learned how to do was overcome his accent to learn how to enunciate words properly. In fact, Caleb Bingham says in his introduction uh, that it, he assumed rightly that most people who did not have a formal education had very pronounced accents. The dialects and accents then were far more pronounced than they are today. And Caleb Bingham borrows from the classical, great classical order, Demosthenes, and says, in order to enunciate properly, take a little pebble and put it under your tongue so you know the location of your tongue so you can learn how to enunciate words properly. When Douglas escaped slavery to, he settled in Boston, outside of Boston, uh, first New Bedford outside of Boston for five years, uh, the one book he took with him, or the one item he took with him when he escaped slavery was the Columbian Order. It was his most treasured book uh, in his life. He first started speaking, public speaking, while he was still a slave. He taught other slaves on the plantation in the eastern shore of Maryland. He taught them Sunday school and preached to them. When he first settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, he first spoke to large audiences as a preacher in the AME Church in New Bedford. Then he began speaking in the abolition circuit in New Bedford. And when he went to a national anti-slavery or abolition convention in Nantucket, he was so-called discovered by William Lloyd Garrison, who was so impressed with his oratory that the American Anti-Slavery Society hired Douglas to become a full-time paid lecturer, which raised the question, well, what was he like as an orator? Douglas was blessed in many respects. He was blessed by having a very rich, deep, baritone voice. He was also an excellent singer. His wife, Anna Murray, was also, uh, loved, also loved music, and they played duets together. They sang together. And singing is important for oratory because his voice had a musical quality. It was a deep, bar rich baritone voice. Another aspect that was important to his oratory was that he was, everyone said that he was handsome, even his detractors, uh, and that's important. He was also a great comic. He would mimic slave owners. From the time he first started speaking uh, in New Bedford, uh, and until r roughly 1850, he would draw howls of laughter by mimicking slave owners, by using sarcasm and irony. And during this period, he would just take down a few notes, know where he would start and finish, and extemporize. And he was as much an actor or performer on stage as he was a public speaker who read. Then, as the, it's called the Lyceum Circuit, it was a circuit designed really for intellectuals, for people who wanted a more engaged lecture, which assumed or presupposed that you wrote down the speech, and it was often published and circulated for those who couldn't attend, and, he, and you got paid more. Douglas started writing down, writing out his speeches, committing much of it to memory and delivering the speech that way. He lost some of his humor as a public speaker because he increasingly believed that the gravity of his message, which was the horror of slavery and the way in which slavery dehumanizes people, cut against 
the laughter that he brought out from his audiences. What to the slave is the 4th of July he delivered in 1852. It was the 4th of July address. It was the most prestigious address in the United States that an order could give. If you were asked to give a 4th of July address, it was considered a great honor. By this point, he had left Boston and was living in Rochester, and uh, he was already uh, the most famous public speaker in the United States. And that fame and his freedom really came because of his success as an orator. When Douglas first started speaking for the American Anti Slavery Society, he was still a fugitive slave. And he chiefly described his experiences in slavery as a way to convert the multitude, which he did most places that he went. But because he was a fugitive, he could not describe who his masters were, where he lived. He had to hide those details because he could be recaptured. And he was such an effective orator that audiences increasingly suspected that he was a fraud said, You're su you have such a brilliant way with words. You're such a brilliant order. There's no way you could have been a slave. There's no way you could not have had any formal education. And truth-telling was the most powerful weapon for an abolitionist, because if you tell the truth about slavery and highlight the fact that slavery is a state of war between master and slave, it's an attempt to dehumanize slave, that will convert people to the anti-slavery cause. And that's what prompted Douglas to publish his first autobiography. He says, I have to silence these accusations of fraud. I'm going to tell all the details of my life story as a slave, even despite the risk of naming my owners and saying who, where I was from. When Wendell Phillips, the white abolitionist, read the manuscript, he told Douglas to... If it were me, I'd throw it in the fire because you're going to get captured and sent back into slavery. Douglas published it anyway. It was uh, immense success. It was a bestseller. In fact, it was so successful that the American Anti-Slavery Society was rightly worried about his safety, his freedom, and they sent him to England, Ireland, and Scotland for two years. And it was there he spoke to ever larger crowds and British sympathizers, uh, contacted his owners, Hugh and Thomas Ald and uh, negotiated a sale. So when Douglas returned, he was a legal free man. And by this point, he wanted to become, he wanted to publish a newspaper. He was becoming um, more, uh, more interested in and believed that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document, more interested in politics. He was, I think, a brilliant political critic and he didn't want to compete with uh, William Lloyd Garrison's liberator, so he moves to Rochester, which was a journalistic city, uh, attracted a lot of journalists. It was also the, an abolitionist hotbed like Boston. And it's there that he gave one of his great speeches, probably his best known speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, although in my view it's hard to single out uh, that speech is superior to 20 or so other great speeches that he gave. But I'll, by the end of the talk, I'll, you'll understand why I'm focusing on this speech. So he was asked to give it on, uh, for the 4th of July oration. Uh, he actually gave it on July 5th, not July 4th. Why did he give it on July 5th and not July 4th? There are two reasons. One, July 4th, occurred on a Sunday in 1852, not a Saturday, and people treat the Sunday as a Sabbath. Second, and more significantly, New York State blacks had a tradition of celebrating the 4th of July on the 5th, rather than the 4th, to highlight the contradictions between the ideals of freedom and equality in the, con in the Declaration and the expansion of slavery, uh, especially by 1852. He was invited to give the speech by the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester. The crowd was uh, over a thousand or so, mostly white, but some black uh, anti-slavery 
people are abolitionists. And Douglas had a brilliant sense of who his audiences were. If you read a speech that Douglas would give to, to African-Americans in his AME Zion Church in Rochester, it was a very different in tone than a speech he gave to a lot of white women and some men uh, into Corinthian Hall in Rochester in uh, 1852. But let me describe the power of this speech. It was called, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. He wrote it out. He labored over it. He wanted it to be something that, he would, that would be remembered and would be read. The pamphlet sold out. It was considered a great success. And let me give you a brief exegesis of it, meaning kind of unpack it and uh, show why it still is so important. It's a rhetorical masterpiece because it involves a double reversal, meaning he starts at one place, he shocks or surprises the audiences, takes him, takes him to another place, and then he comes back. It's, as, it's a three-act play, so to speak. If you're familiar with narrative or story, Aristotle and Poetics says the greatest stories have three acts. The reversal involved, a, it's called from the classical oratory, chiasmus. It's repetition with a difference. It's a reversal from A to B to C. And the three parts also involve past, present, and future. He begins his speech by putting his audience at ease, puffing them up, making them feel proud about being Americans, making them feel proud and good and happy about the things that Americans have accomplished. So he begins by saying, you have good reason to be joyful and thankful on this 4th of July. Look at uh, the great things that Americans, that you Americans have done to create this nation. And if you were a careful listener, you would anticipate a reversal because he uses the pronoun you and distinguishes himself from the Americans. And about 20 minutes into the speech, it's like he slaps them across the face slams the hammer down on the lectern, so to speak, and says, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called on to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? At the federal level, blacks, most people didn't consider black citizens. Most people didn't consider blacks a, uh, a participating in the ideals of freedom and uh, equality. Most white Americans considered blacks subhuman. So after he's puffed up his audience and make them feel good, and rhetorically it's a way of connecting with your audience, drawing attention to your audience. Uh, having the audience in the palm of the hand, then you slap them down, and he spends the next hour just making them slink into the floor and feel embarrassed and ultimately mad, describing how despite the founding ideals of this nation, slavery is expanding, the fugitive slave law virtually legitimates the kidnapping of free blacks and is trying to enslave all blacks. The church is responsible for expanding and increasing slavery. The church is a bulwark of slavery. He contrasts England, this so-called monarchy, with American democracy and says, you know what, England is a lot more democratic in the United States. When I was in England, he says, I could, it's the first time in my life where I could walk down the street and people treated me with respect as a gentleman. 
They didn't spit in my face. They didn't hit me. They didn't call me a nigger. And I could go into any public establishment. He said, when I was in England, it was the first time in my life where I experienced a dearth of racism. Now, even in Rochester, I can't walk down the street without someone sneering at me or spitting at me. He also describes how today in the present people have slandered the Constitution, calling the Constitution a document that protects and helps to expand slavery. Douglas says the Constitution is inherently an anti-slavery document. The preamble seeks to secure the blessings of liberty. There's no mention of slave, slavery, or Negro in the Constitution. It embraces, uh, provides uh, equality before the law. And then after spending an hour, a little over an hour, just slamming his audience to the ground, he lifts them back up. That's the third part of the reversal. And this transition is, I leave off where I began with hope. It's now in the future. It's the third reversal, or the second reversal. Leave off with hope. Hope that the ideals of the Declaration will unite with the Constitution. Hope and faith that his audience will, and Americans in general, will recognize their sins, their bad behavior, and seek to fulfill those ideals of the Declaration. He speaks as a prophet, and he knows his audience and knows that they too believe that God is on their side, as Lincoln would later say in the second inaugural. And he ends by imagining at this future moment, the United States is this celestial place in which slavery has been abolished, in which equality before the law and freedom is the law of the land. And the reason that that speech was so effective then is because it functioned as a Jeremiah. Jeremiah is from the Bible. It's technically a song of lament. You lament the decline of the present. And the rhetorical function in terms of persuading your audience is to encourage them to inspire them to restore the society to its former greatness. To lift it back up much as he's lifted up his audience to a place where those ideals can be realized. This rhetorical move, and as you know, rhetoric is the art of persuasion, Douglas also recognized was one of the most popular and common tropes that was immensely successful. Jonathan, from Jonathan Edwards, who was one of the great ministers, used that Jeremiah on most sermons uh, through Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is another great orator. And the Jeremiah has remained one of the most effective tools for public speakers, and especially today for politicians. Donald Trump, his success in part stems from his use of a Jeremiah. Let's make America great again. We're presently in this moment of declension. We've declined. We used to be great. He slams his audiences all the time. He's very good at that. He also he connects with them. Based on the reports, people, part of his appeal rhetorically is that people believe in this Jeremiah today. We're at a moment of decline. We used to be great. 
we need to restore the greatness. That speech, that message, that three-act play, so to speak, is an immensely effective weapon at rallying people to your cause. Ronald Reagan did the same thing. It's morning in America, and his morning was in the future. I would argue that Republicans today are more effective, have been more effective, at using the Jeremiah than Democrats to the loss of Democrats. And Douglas recognized how powerful that is. Let me show you some images to capture, because Douglas was a, um, was a uh, performer as much as a speaker. I'll just show you some images. This is the first known photograph of Douglas just as he started speaking out against slavery was a paid lecture, a professional order. In 1841, it's a daguerreotype by the Boston collector, uh, Greg French. And you have the young Frederick Douglass in a beautiful afro. And he's dressed up. He always dressed up. He was always immensely disciplined. As an order, practiced his speeches. He'd try to come to the venue before, make sure the lighting is just right, like an actor on the stage. Because part of the function, part of his purpose in public speaking was to out-citizen white citizens, to show him through his mastery of words, through his brilliance as an orator, that he had every right to be a citizen as a white citizen. He had every right to enjoy the democratic rights that white citizens did. And what he's fighting against is this, the kind of racism that I'll show you. This was an illustration from a work of science called Types of Mankind by these anthropologists, or uh, Josiah Knott and George Glidden. And it was a very common um, subject, which was scientists, or technically pseudoscientists, who would argue that blacks are innately inferior to whites. And this book is an unusual book because although it was a work of science and they were highly respected, it was also a popular bestseller. In fact, it went through multiple editions. And this illustration really summarizes the book's thesis. It shows a uh, statue of Apollo Belvedere, a Negro, a chimpanzee, and then their skulls. Now, how you get a skull out of the statue of Apollo Belvedere, who's supposedly the representative white. He's the embodiment of a Anglo-Saxon white in the American imagination. How you get a statue or a skull, a, a skull out of a statue, I'm not sure, but they did. And the reason for the skulls is that their argument is that if the line from the forehead down to the jawline was vertical, they argued that there was greater, grain, greater brain, more brain and a larger cranium capacity. And the slanted brow meant, they argued, that there was less brain and less cranial capacity. And essentially this image is they're arguing that blacks are more akin to apes than they are to humans. And the very term highbrow, lowbrow, comes from that old racist designation. It's a hugely popular book. Here's another example of the racism Douglas is fighting against. It's a painting by Charles Dias uh, from The Devil and Tom Walker, uh, which was a very popular uh, story at the time and it was circulated. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that the devil right here is cast as a black man. Whenever whites described a devil, 90% of the time the devil was cast as black. This is Edward Clay, the nephew of Henry Clay, 
one of the great statesmen of his day. Henry Clay believed the same thing that Edward Clay did. And it's called the fruits of amalgamation, which really means he's imagining a world in which slavery has ended and there is racial equality in the United States. And essentially, it's an image that highlights the degree to which most white Americans at the time can't even imagine racial equality. If blacks are free and equal, there's going to be black superiority than white superiority. Fruits of amalgamation, fruits of racial equality and freedom is that the slave now becomes the master. The former white is now a servant. Uh, it plays on uh, the racist uh, belief that if black men are free, they're going to want to have sex with white women. So he marries a white woman and they have these grotesque looking children. And on the wall here is a, photo or a picture of William Lloyd Garrison. Here is a, a portrait of uh, Shakespeare's Othello, an interracial uh, union or marriage. And a dog here is chewing up Tom Paine's Age of Reason. It's an image to suggest that uh, racial equality is anything but reasonable. And even a sympathetic illustrator, and this, there, this was uh, the painter Richard Kate in Woodville, war news from Mexico, uh, and it was disseminated with thousands of prints. The reason I'm showing it is that it shows a collection, a wide range of white men in a, under the portico of the American Hope Hotel, symbolizing that for almost all white Americans, American democracy was a white man's democracy. It was limited to being a white man's democracy. You have two blacks outside of the portico, outside of uh, the American democracy, who are rendered sympathetically, but they're still not participants in the democracy. And Southerners cast slaves as being part of their big happy family. Didn't explain, didn't want to share, didn't want to advertise the fact that uh, if they had sex with their female slaves, it would increase their wealth. And this is Douglas in 1852, the year he gave what to the slave is the 4th of July. It's his characteristic look. One convert to the cause saw this and said he was majestic in his wrath. It's a wonderful summary, encapsulation of how Douglas appeared on stage. Majestic and wrathful trying to galvanize the audience. Here's another image like this. Majestic in his wrath. This is an engraving based on a lost photograph, and sometimes he's clenching his fists as if ready to duel, ready to fight. Here's a profile portrait where he's also ready, fits clenched. Civil War photograph, again, majestic and wrathful. He's so famous, part because of his oratory, that in the second inaugural, he's right in the crowd, and Lincoln is giving the address right there. Lincoln sees him, invites him, he goes to the reception afterwards, and, and Lincoln says of Douglas, here comes my friend. What would you think of my address? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. You couldn't ask for a better response. Douglas received by Mary Todd Lincoln the cane that Lincoln used. His oratory led him. He was covered in the newspapers frequently. This is the one photograph of Douglas actually giving a speech. And he's giving a speech at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute in Booker T. I think is right there. And here's another venue in which Douglas is speaking, or Douglas is, is about ready to speak, I'm sorry, and his white abolitionist friend Garrett S Smith is speaking. And there he is, there's Douglas writing out a speech. It's the only portrait where Douglas is noticeably smiling. He never smiled on stage when he was speaking because he doesn't want 
to play into the racist stereotype of the happy slave or the happy black. Racism and slavery is serious business, serious work. Douglass has inspired millions of people, truly, with his oratory, his writings, from his time. And hopefully he will continue to inspire us in the future to complete the unfinished work of the ideals, still unfinished work of the ideals in the Declaration and fulfill finally those ideals of freedom and equality of opportunity for all people. Thank you. Um, do you think that Frederick Douglass became a preacher because that was really the best venue to be a orator at first, or because he was highly religious? He was, he, uh, D Douglass was very religious, very religious. Um, when I said he was a, he spoke as a prophet in the What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, um, he really was. He believed that God, he, that he, God was on his side. He believed that he was called, that God wanted him, that God believed slavery was a horrible evil, that uh, it was a great inspiration for him, as it was for so many slaves, because for someone like Douglas especially, who's a slave and when he first runs away, I mean, he has, he's comparatively powerless. If you believe that God has called you to work hard, to learn to read and write, that's immensely empowering. Douglas becomes a revolutionary in the 1850s. He says that a slaveholder has no right to live. So as I'll conspire against the United States government if I think it will help end slavery, if I think it'll work. That sense of empowerment comes from his faith. Plus, it also greatly helped his oratory. I mean, he truly did know the Bible, I mean, honestly, better than any minister that I've read or heard today, and I've read and heard a lot of them. Um, he recognized the great um, emancipatory message both in the Old Testament, in Exodus, in Isaiah in particular, and in the message of the entire New Testament. Christ's central message is one of freedom. It was hugely important to him. What happened uh, to Douglass's reception after the Civil War, and especially after Reconstruction, when there was waning interest in the North? in black civil rights? Yeah, that's a great question. The, Douglas becomes the first, he becomes an elder statesman. He becomes a leader in the Republican Party and devotes after Reconstruction the rest of his life to um, keeping the faith and continuing to protest. Uh, he is the first African American to receive a federal appointment that requires Senate approval when he's the Marshal of the District of Columbia. He's the recorder of deeds. He's the first black ambassador when he's the ambassador of Haiti. Uh, and through the rest of his life, he remains uh, an activist. In fact, uh, a year before he dies, shortly before he dies, he received a number of calls from young men and women. And there was one young man who was uh, a very good student, who was very ambitious. He was in his 20s. And he, made a pilgrimage to Douglas to see him, to ask what he should do. What can I do to help myself and my country? He said, I'm thinking of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. And Douglas responds, agitate, agitate, agitate. In fact, the last um, 20 years of his life, he said, you know, I thought, I thought the battle had been won. And I feel like I'm, we're starting over again, almost. Uh, so he, despite his age, uh, by this point, the, his speeches were printed everywhere, so he didn't have to travel as much. Early on, you know, he was, he was on the road 
more than he was home from 1840s to 1860. He was on the road more than he was home. I'm assuming that the American Abolition Society also made efforts to win his freedom. Uh, what, what happened with that, or did they? Yes, yeah, so, so how did the, um, the American Anti-Slavery Society, after Douglas publishes his narrative as a tell-all to um, silence the people who accused him of being a fraud, uh, they, and the book becomes popular, they realized that his life was in danger, so they sent him, they sent him to England, Ireland, and Scotland, and uh, so that prevented him from being subject to being re-enslaved. And his master actually had, uh, Hugh Ald, one of his masters, published an article in the Boston newspaper, because he had read Douglas's narrative, and his, his, the portrait of Thomas and Hugh Ald are not very pleasant, and said, I'll go to any length possible to recapture him. And it was Douglas's sympathizers who, in Britain who uh, purchased his freedom. When Douglas returns, he broke with the American Anti-Slavery Society. And the reason he broke with them is because the American Anti-Slavery Society argued that the Constitution was pro-slavery and that you could not thus rely on the federal government. And Douglas, as an activist, recognized that the federal government was a great weapon that you could rely on. That to not treat the Constitution as a sacred text, as a text that you could rely on, that you could use to advocate for emancipation, made your job much more difficult. And he also genuinely believed that the Constitution, came to genuinely believe that the Constitution was anti-slavery because of the lack of uh, terms Negro, slave, slavery in them. And that's something that increasingly scholars, despite the, despite the, uh, the um, compromises in the Constitution, that the, most of the founders and framers believed that slavery was an e evil. That's what Douglas understood. And because of that break, uh, and because Douglas was frankly more famous than anyone else in the American Anti-Slavery Society, there was some competition. Plus, uh, Garrison had been uh, a mentor to him. And when Douglas left for Rochester, he didn't tell Garrison. Derek Garrison had to find out secondhand and felt a bit sucker punched, and Garrison kept grudges. And so they, uh, their friendship essentially waned from the late 1840s, but they reunited again in this, uh, during the Civil War. And I should say the American Anti-Slavery Society, one of the reasons that they called the Constitution pro-slavery, and they advocated disunion. They said the United States is so thoroughly corrupt, let's just advocate disunion is because they recognized that the union between the Northerners and Southerners is what helped slavery expand, because it meant that Northerners were continually compromising with these belligerent, aggressive Southerners. And the American anti-slavery recognizes that if there is disunion, that's the end of slavery. And they were ultimately right. And in fact, right after secession occurred, or right after, or short, right after the South bombs Fort Sumner, virtually everyone in the American Anti-Slavery Study suddenly jumps all for the Union, said, now the Constitution's on our side. We're going to fight for it. So it was as much a rhetor it was partly a rhetorical ploy, partly a political and strategic ploy for those reformers. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Sure. More so than any other abolitionist, any other American, it was Douglas who understood the implications of his country's love affair, its fascination with this new technology.